we are talking on principles of sonship. Okay, so this is the series we've been in for a little bit of time, and I think we're going to continue it a little bit more. Principles of sonship. And just as a real quick review, sonship is walking as the son walked. Okay, uh, Romans 8, we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of God's son. And so we're called to walk as he walked. Jesus says that the disciple is not above the teacher, but when fully trained becomes like the teacher. And so as you look at kind of this pattern, this growth of spiritual uh, maturity, we start low and we come up here. This is where the sun is. And when we reach this level of sonship, then that is the level I'm talking about with this principles of sonship. What happens is somewhere probably around right in this area, for my audio listeners, I'm drawing kind of a, a horrible scale. Think of a... We'll figure this one out. Think of a graph that grows upwards, all right, at an angle. And that's our spiritual growth. Once we pass this point of where we're no longer focused on the flesh, no longer being led by the flesh, but we're being led by the Spirit, that's where you enter into this thing we call sonship. Being led by the Spirit is not what most people think because most people operate in the flesh still. Led by the Spirit, the very simple definition of sonship, of walking in the image of Christ, being led by the Spirit, all those are the same. But the simple definition is you clearly hear God's direction and you do God's direction. You turn away from yourself and you do only what the Lord's calling you to do. It's a constant process of decision-making based only on what the Lord is directing. This is what Kathy asked on the last time about people saying, well, uh, I asked the Lord where to go and what to do and ask Him for a... um, uh, parking space and all these things. But what, what it really is, okay, is when you have decisions, rather than doing what you think is wise, what you think is best, you stop and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And by definition, walking in sonship means that you hear the Lord. If you can't discern, clearly discern his leading, then you're not walking in sonship. You may be walking in greater levels of Maturity as you grow, but in order to walk in sonship means that you're walking at that level where you clearly hear what the Father is directing you, or maybe in case what the Son is directing, what God Himself is directing you. And you hear it enough so that when you start to take a step, you go, oh, He's telling me not to do that. So you pull back and you do something else. It's just having that discernment. And many times that discernment is going to be audible. You can actually hear the Lord speak in words. Other times it's just very, I I just know it, right? Something in your heart. I wanted to also cover real quickly, we've been talking about three groups of people in this uh, arena of sonship. Let me just shift this a little bit. And these three groups of people, we have what we call the common people. Common people. We have the Levite servants. And then we have the priests. And we find this, these are the three groups of people that we see within the nation of Israel. And we've been using these as kind of the markers for what role different groups of people pay, play within God's kingdom. What we found with the uh, common people in the Old Testament, these are the 12 tribes. Okay? And the 12 tribes are the ones that do all the, what I'll call the labor of the economy. They do all of the work of the nation. Okay, let's just call it GDP, right? The gross domestic product. They're the ones that are plowing the fields, tending to the um, the herds. They're the ones making things. Then you have the Levite servants. And these are the people that are ministering 
to the people. Okay, these are the uh, what I'll call the ministers. They bring as the people, the 12 tribes are bringing in tithes and offerings and sacrifices. They are ministering to the people. So these are what I call people facing. The Levite servants, they're facing the people, receiving their tithes and offerings, and then processing that on behalf of the Lord. And then the priests are the ones who are uh, engaged directly with the Lord. So these engage the Lord. The priests engage the Lord. They're the ones that receive what the Levite servants have processed for sacrifice. And then they actually will lay that on the altar because the altar is in the inner courtyard. They will do the wave offering. They'll um, uh, splatter the blood. They'll take it into the Lord's presence. So this is kind of the the groundwork of how that society works. But I want to relate this to what it means. This is the way I see it, okay? This is how I see these three groups of people within the world of Christendom. The common people are those people that are focused on self, These are all, I'm talking about believers only, okay? So the believers who are focused on themselves, they may be a good Christian, they may know the scriptures, they go to church all the time, but when, like in their work or their career, they're just focused on driving for self. They may give their tithe, they may give some offering, but they're really focused on self. It's all about me, it's all about uh, my business, my career, my surroundings, my lifestyle. Then you move into the Levite servants, and this is focused on others. The Levite servants represents those believers who are now, they're taking their focus off their self to minister to others. This is why in the early stages I was saying this is primarily the church workers, the pastors, the evangelists, the missionaries, the uh, mercy ministry, the counselors, all the parachurch organizations where they're focused on others to minister to them uh, in the name of the Lord. And then you have the priests, and this, these are the people who are focused on the Lord himself. Okay? So we see that self is focused on themselves, others is people-facing, and the Lord, the priest, is facing the Lord. And this is the sonship category right here. The priests. We also found when we looked at this that the priests come from the family of Aaron. Okay? So, the real quick synopsis you have Moses, who is a type of Christ, and Moses' brother is Aaron. This is his brother. Moses is the type of Christ. He he acted in the role of the high priest. He's the one that actually came into the Holy of Holies. He's one that engaged directly with the Father. Today, that is Jesus. Jesus is our high priest. And who are Jesus' brothers? We are. Yeah. So, we're the brothers. And that's where we then pick up this role of priesthood because the brother of the high priest is the priest. Okay, So we're in the priestly category as we move into this level of maturity with the Lord. A couple other things on this as we move there. I mentioned this earlier, but it's uh, moving into the priesthood, into sonship. Okay, That's what this is. This is what I call sonship. You can call it Uh, just a high level of maturity and walking in Christ. But it's characterized by denying yourself. It's characterized by dying to yourself and really seeking only the Lord, attempting to do everything that the Lord has clearly said and not do anything that He has not said. This is what Jesus said. I only do what the Father tells me to do. The other thing that's real interesting, I had a conversation after one of these sessions with someone. This, the sonship, is not about the miraculous. Just because someone can go out and 
raise the dead, or because someone goes out and heals everyone they pray for, or because they can uh, speak in tongues or give great prophecy or anything like that, that does not mean that they're operating at a high level of maturity. Gifts do not require maturity. In fact, the, the book where we learn most about what we call the power gifts, the supernatural gifts, that everyone thinks th- these are the gifts, right? Healing, raising the dead, miracles, words of knowledge. They kind of lose sight of the other gifts like administration, hospitality, all these other things that are more common. More common because they're not supernatural. People don't reject those gifts. But a lot of times people will reject the supernatural. But where we find most of our information about the gifts is one of the most backward, wayward, backsliding churches, the Corinthians. They had the gifts. (laughs) It's not because they walked in Christ. It's because they needed that little extra boost, would be my guess. But what I want to clarify is, is walking at this level has nothing to do with the miraculous. There are a lot of people who walk in the level of sonship that do not have much miraculous power. You know, they don't operate in the miraculous. When at times they do, but it's not their mode. So when you see someone that is always in the element of the miraculous gifts, a lot of times we want to put them on the pedestal and say that they are really walking strong with the Lord. But that's not what it is. The gifts are without repentance. Only by repentance do you walk in greater maturity because you're repenting from those sins, which means that you're turning from them and you're not doing them anymore. The other thing about this level of sonship is the real focus is doing only what the Lord has called you to do and doing it only in the way that he has called you to do it. We talked about this some last time where uh, I talked about trying to get my book out, right? The Prayer of Freedom. And doing it in my strategy, and the Lord shut me down on that. And he said, no, you're going to do my work my way, not your way. And so it's this fine line of trying to make sure that you do it his way. And everything that you do when you're in service to the Lord needs to be done his way. And that also means that his way means you need to know it, which means you need to hear him which means you need to discern his voice from your voice and all the other voices. So one key element that I've learned, or that I'm, I'll say that I have, uh, I apply as a, as a requirement here, is you must be able to hear clearly the Lord's voice in your life. Okay, you must be able to hear clearly. If all you get is, You pray and you pray and you pray and you think you feel this nudge in your heart. That's not at sonship level. That's somewhere behind there, okay? Sonship level is um, like if you were to look at my list. So I, I keep a list of questions here. And probably every couple of days, I've got three or four or five questions. Lord, what about this? What about this? This and this and this. And he's constantly guiding me, directing me. So my next phase with the book are these items. What do you want me to do? And I'm processing what I do specifically on what he says. That's what I'm talking about is being able to approach him and say, what do I do here? What do you want me to do? And then he directs you on that. So that's sonship. In our last several lessons... Let me flip this back around. To catch us up to date with where we've been going through, we've been talking on this kind of a mini-series called Do Not Sweat. It's part of the principles of sonship. And it comes from Ezekiel 44. And these are the seven rules of the priest, which are the seven rules of walking in sonship. And... We're on our last one now, so we've had six so far. So the first one, I'll just read these out, and you can follow with me if you want to. But this is Ezekiel 45, excuse me, Ezekiel 44, starting in verse 15, and we'll go through 28. And I'm skipping a lot, so, you know, catch me and follow me if you can. 
So it starts out that the Levitical priests, number one, will serve as my ministers. They will stand in my presence and offer sacrifices, says the sovereign Lord. They alone will enter my sanctuary to serve me. So this is to the rule. Number one is serve in his presence. Okay, this is the first rule of the priests. And as sons, we serve the Lord in his presence, not praying to him, which we do, but actually engaging into his presence behind that veil. Rule number two is the um, uh, verse 17 B. They must wear no wool while on duty in the inner courtyard or in the temple itself. They must not wear anything that would cause them to perspire. So priests are not allowed to sweat. Not allowed to sweat. And here's the key word. While on duty. Okay? So the priests were normal people, but their role was to serve the Lord. What that means is while they are serving the Lord, doing what the Lord has called them to do, they're not allowed to sweat. They wear different garments. They wear garments of linen. While the outer courtyard is full of activity and hustle hustle and bustle, once you move into the inner courtyard where the priests are work on duty, they walk slow. Because if you walk fast, you're going to perspire. So everything they do is deliberately slow, methodical, quiet, because they're not allowed to sweat while on duty. And what this means to us is while on duty is when we're doing what the Lord has called us to do, we're not allowed to sweat. We're not allowed to use our fleshly exertion or our fleshly wisdom to accomplish what he wants us to do. Because nothing of the flesh pleases the Lord, because the flesh is always contrary to the Lord. We've been called while on duty to do what the Lord has called us to do in his way, in his power, by his spirit. And this is what being led by the spirit is all about. It's like with my book. I want it to get out to everyone. But the Lord says, you just get it out in people's hands. It's my job to encourage them to then do something more with it. Then rule number three, we start to see this in verse 23. They will teach my people the difference between what is holy and what is common. So the third rule of the priest is to teach God's people. As a son, we're to teach people. That's a primary role of ours, to take those who are in the growth phase of maturing in Christ and teach them what it means to grow more. The Lord shared with me a while back that my role is to raise up sons. I don't teach at a really simple level. I don't teach beginners. I teach those maturing in Christ to say, let's cross the line and let's continue to go higher. Okay, And that's what, God's, uh, that's what priests do, is they teach God's people the difference between what is holy and what is common, how to pursue Him more. Verse 24, they will serve as judges among my people. Okay, so uh, serve as judges who rule. Judges rule because they uh, decree the law and we're to serve from his presence on his laws and rule and our little Parameter, parameters that he gives us opportunity in. Um, number five is right after that. And the priests themselves must obey my instructions and decrees. So this is rule number five. Obey his instructions. And this is what we we're talking about earlier. Do the Lord's work his way. His work, His way, because you're obeying His instructions on doing that. And then the last thing we talked about last uh, session is number six. And they are to see to it that the Sabbaths are set apart as holy days. So this is now keep the Sabbath holy. Not only keep it holy, 
themselves, but to see that it is set apart as holy days. In other words, make sure that his people are keeping it holy. We talked about the Sabbath a little bit last time, a little bit ad hoc. And we found that when you honor the Lord by honoring the Sabbath, you delight in the Lord. In other words, it's a cause and effect. As you honor the Sabbath, you delight in the Lord. It's not that you honor the Sabbath because you delight in the Lord. Honoring the Sabbath actually comes first. That's what we saw in, in the passage, I think, is in Isaiah. The other thing we saw about the Sabbath is when you stop honoring the Sabbath and you stop keeping it holy, it's a crack in the dam. You don't notice it at first. You know, when you have a great big dam holding up a bunch of water and there's a crack there, you don't notice it at first. It's just a little bit of drip of water. But then over time, it gets bigger and bigger. And, he, and then at some point, it, the whole dam fails. And all of the water just gushes through because it's gotten weak. That's what happens when we stop honoring the Sabbath. This is what happened with Israel and Judah. They stopped honoring the Sabbath. And the Lord kept telling them, honor me, honor me, honor the Sabbath. Keep it holy. They didn't. And they just turned so far away from the Lord that the Lord destroyed them. The only thing that the Lord gives in the Bible as the reason he had Israel and Judah destroyed and taken into captivity was because they did not honor his Sabbath. That's the beginning of all the other apostasy that they went into. So now I want to talk on the last verse of our passage, verse 28. This is rule number seven. The priest will not have any property or possession of land, for I alone am their special possession. And rule number seven is no property, no labor. So you're not going to do not labor for your provision. So this rule is very similar to rule number two, you're not allowed to sweat while on duty, which means you're not allowed to put forth fleshly exertion to do God's work. Notice how rule number seven is very similar. Because they don't have any property, they're not allowed to labor for any provision. Let me give you a little background on this. Background on this, let me just kind of clear off some of our board and show this to you. It makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so what happened is when God brought Israel out of Egypt, so they were in slavery in Egypt, they exited the Egypt and they're headed to the promised land. This is the land that God promised Abraham to give to his descendants. And God said that when you get there, Everything's going to be ready. All the cisterns are going to be dug. All the vineyards are going to be planted. All the trees are going to be uh, producing. There'll be houses and everything. You're just literally going to walk in. And that's basically what happened. They took over the nation and pushed out the inhabitants because those inhabitants had been violating God's laws. And God, the, the time had come to uh, for God to... Um, displace them, and put his people in their place. But what was happening is when they came out of Egypt, there were 13 tribes that exited Egypt. When they went into the promised land, there were 12 tribes that went into the promised land. And what happened to the missing tribe? That missing tribe is the Levites, right? So you have the Levites. They were devoted to the Lord. They were, uh, they, they fought for the Lord's honor. And so as they came out of, the, out of Egypt, they're in the wilderness. At the time that Moses was up on the mountain and it was taking a while, so they made a golden calf and started worshiping it. Moses came down all upset and he yelled out, who will stand on the Lord's side and defend the Lord's honor, or that's not his words, but that's our terminology, right? <clears throat> and only one group of people, the Levites did. 
He said, strap on your sword and kill everyone that worshiped this idol. And so they did. And the Lord said, I'm so pleased with you. I'm so pleased with your fervor and for my honor that I am going to choose you as my tribe. So now you have 12 tribes of Israel and God's tribe of the Levites. Out of the Levites you have, that's where the Levite servants and the Levite, uh, Levite priests. But then when they come into the promised land, the 12 tri- tribes were given land. Okay? So like if, if this were Israel, let me just kind of draw something. If this were Israel, what happened is God divided. You see this. He actually draws out the boundaries of all of these areas. The men help draw out some maybe. And, but each boundary is assigned to a different tribe. So the tribes were given land. Within these tribal lands, you have cities. And the Levites were given the cities. Okay, so the Levites have the cities. And they had the land surrounding the city. So the Levites could go out and they could plant crops and harvest the crop and tend to it. But the priests were given no property or possession. Only the Levite servants. So the question is, why is that? Because the the priests are a special class of God's people. They are those who represent walking as Christ walked in full maturity, serving him in his presence. And I want to walk you through a little bit how this starts to play out. So because the priests had no property, that meant that their inheritance was entirely the Lord, their inheritance, their provision for all that they needed. All of the provision for the priests were given to them. Not a single bit of their provision did they work for. See, the Levite servants... They received provision from the tithes and offerings, but they also went out and they plowed the fields around each of the cities because the fields around the cities were their land, but they weren't the priest's land. So the Levite servants, you see, are now, if I were to bring this back over to this side, for my... um, Audio listeners, I've got the three categories of people listed. Common people, Levite servants, and the priests. Was it just the capital city or was it all the cities? Just the cat. Well, the, so they had cities of refuge. Yeah. And so they were given all the cities of refuge were okay. the Levites. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so what happened is the priests had no property no possession. And what that means that as far as provision, all provision was given to them by the Lord. They had no ability to work and toil for it. The Levites had no land, but they did have no land in terms of the large, um, like what we would call a state. But they had the cities and they had the fields around them. And so they were sort of a hybrid. Some of their provision was given by the Lord, and some of it was from their own toil. And then you have the common people, and the common people were the ones that were given the land, and their provision was of their own effort all by itself. They had to toil. So as you move from the common people to the Levite servants, you kind of have this blending, some toil and some given by the Lord. But then as you move from the Levite servants to the priest, you find that it's entirely given by the Lord and they were prevented from doing any labor for their provision because they were given no possession. Their possession was the Lord alone. Is this making sense? So what this means is they were not allowed, the priests were not allowed to sweat by toiling for their own provision. And this is kind of the way it is as we walk in greater maturity in Christ and into this, this category that I call walking in sonship is, is our provision is to come only from the Lord himself as well. 
the Lord always sends it through natural means, right? Even though all the priest provision was given to them by the Lord, it came through the natural means of the common people funneling it through. The same thing happens with us. Like, I have a business. I don't really work in it. I I tend it, right? I tend it. But I'm not focused on how do I make a harvest happen. I'm not out there toiling in the fields of my business and trying to bring in a harvest because the Lord said, that's my job. I'm talking about him. You know, that's his job. Right. I'm simply the steward, right? (laughs) Oh, and that's something else. So watch this. The high priest, the priest were over the Levite servants. Mm -hmm. And the Levite servants essentially were over the common people. So you still have this authority leadership where... You know, as me, I'm over the workers. That's exactly right. So when we're walking, the more we're walking in sonship, okay? So if I were just to take a line from the common people to the priests, and this is that line of maturity in Christ. As we start to mature in Christ, what happens is our the way we receive provision changes. In the common people, where you're focused entirely on yourself, it's all up to you. So this is where you get the adage, pray like it's up to God and work like it's up to you. And when you do both of that, it'll all work out. So there's a lot of sweat and tears, a lot of anxiousness, a lot of anxiety, a lot of unknowing what's going to happen, and I better work hard. And I need to save and save and save because... You don't know what's going to happen in the future. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's right. If you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> but then as you grow in maturity in Christ, more of your dependency on your provision shifts to the Lord. You still work, but it's a different level of work because you're not toiling as much. You're working with greater confidence, greater uh, recognition that God is providing but you're still putting in lots of hours and you're still focused on it. But then as you continue to grow in maturity in Christ into this level of sonship, you actually start to cease all striving, all toiling for provision. And when I say provision, I'm talking about not just dollars. We think of provision as money, but provision for everything. So all your provision for housing, food, clothing, recreation, relationships, health, Everything. It's kind of like that whole, you know, the whole life experience, the abundant life. And that's what we're seeing with the seventh rule that the priests were given no possession in the land because the Lord was preventing them from laboring for their own provision. That's actually what the Lord has done with me. He has told me do not focus on sales, do not. Focus on generating leads for your business. Do not. I mean, he's actually told me, don't do it. That's my job. You tend to the things that you do, as we talked a couple of times ago. I'm operation partner. He's sales partner. Anything sells, that's him. Anything that's not sales, that's me. Okay? Because the sales is the provision. I'm tending everything else. And that's kind of what we look at as we move into this. We see this a little bit in Malachi. Much of the book of Malachi is, and we're going to look real briefly just at Malachi 3.11, so you can start to turn there if you want. But most of Malachi is the Lord rebuking the priests because they have abandoned their roles. They were not doing what they had been called to do. They were not teaching the people, right? All the rules of the priesthood. Let's go back to them. Well, I've already deleted them. You know. Yeah, I erased it. Oh, so what? Uh, but all the rules of the priesthood of teaching the people, do not sweat, right? Um, all the uh, keeping the Sabbath holy, ma- making sure that it's being kept holy. If you read through Malachi, the whole book is rebuking them. And they weren't even doing anything with the tithes and offerings, giving, you know, encouraging people or giving it themselves. And basically, they were complaining to God because they had nothing. Their lives were destitute. And the Lord says, because you're not doing what I've called you to do. 
He said, and then he starts to, this is Malachi 3, uh, 10 and 11. He says, bring the whole tithe, and we know that means offering as well. Bring the whole tithe and offering into my storehouse and test me now in this. It's the only spot in the Bible where the Lord says to test him. And what we're doing is we're putting his word to the test. That's what he's really mean. Test my word to be true. He says, test me now in this and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing for you so great that you will not have room to take it all in. In other words, watch this. If the priest were to do what God had called them to do, to teach his people, to ensure the Sabbath stays holy, to do these different things, then it would, it would encourage the people. They would operate in more holiness. They would bring tithes and offerings to the Lord because the Lord is vibrant in their lives. And as they bring tithes and offerings to the Lord, then the priests receive an abundant you know, overflowing of all of God's goodness. But when the priests stop teaching God's word and stop doing what God's called them to do, they started to walk in the flesh and not in the spirit, and everything fell apart. That's, for, that's what we start to see with the priesthood as the uh, uh, almost like the, the analogy or the allegory of our life and walking in sonship. If we do as he says to do, then all provision is made for us. But if we stop doing what he's called us to do, all provision falls away. And what we start to see is kind of the, this, um, this idea, this understanding that the more we do his work, his way, the more of the abundant blessings of his provision we receive. The more we do it his way, the more of the provision that he gives us. And I want to walk you through one last thing on item number seven here. So we're going back to our three groups of people from my audio group. I've got the common people, the Levite servants, and the priests. And I want to put this in terms of what type of provision does the Lord provide? So today, we measure all of our provision economically. How much money we have compensates for a lot of things in our life. I want to use money representatively in terms of what God's provision looks like. But I want to make sure that you understand it's not just the, it's not money, right? This is the holistic approach of everything in your life. Jesus says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And that abundant life means good health, great relationships, good quality kids that love the Lord, follow him, no, no junk in your life. All the provision you need, you've got the house, you've got the cars, you've got the things that make life comfortable. It's where you pinch yourself because you can't believe how amazing life is because there's no problems anywhere. No stress, no anxiety, no worries, because you're, you're like walking in this bubble, like in, as I was sharing the other day with some folks. This is what it's like. You have this, this force field, and this is you with this force field that's all around you, okay? No junk can get to you, because what this force field is, is actually no unrepented sin. Because everything you do, you're doing in accordance with what the Lord has directed you, which means you're doing it in His will. So think about this for a moment. If I'm walking in sonship, and I'm making, I'm being very deliberate to make sure that everything I do is what my Father is telling me to do, and Whenever he says don't do that, I don't do it. I, I'm not rebelling, but I'm, I'm being led by the Spirit. The more I'm being led by the Spirit and obeying the Spirit's leading, does it make sense the more I'm in the center of God's will? Yeah. What about the opposite? If I'm rejecting what the Lord is leading me to do, I'm not following the Spirit, but I'm following my own flesh, does it make sense that I'm out of his will? 
When I'm out of his will, when I'm in his will, I'm protected. Because everything that happens in my life is guided and directed by him. But once I get out of his will, if I move outside of his will over here to the left, everything that happens in my life can be consequence and torment and discipline and all kinds of other junk. So once you start moving more and more, operating at this higher level of maturity, then it's like this force field is around you because nothing can attack you. There is no thief to steal, kill, and destroy. We see this in Job 1. If, you're, if you watched any of my spiritual warfare teaching, the very first one, I was talking about Job. And it starts off in Job 1 where God and the sons of God are meeting and Satan is with them too. And God says, have you taken notice of my uh, righteous servant Job? He's a righteous man. And Satan gets all upset. Well, he only loves you because you won't allow me to attack him. Let me have at him and he'll curse you. So Job was walking with this force field concept around him. No attacks. Everything perfect. Why? The Lord protected him. Why? Because Job was repenting all the time. You see this in his continual sacrifices. He had no open doors. He tried to do everything to serve and honor the Lord. And because of that, his life is protected. I share that because when we start talking about what does God's provision look like, I want to take you through a simple understanding. But I want you to understand that this provision is not just money. I'm going to use money as the measurement of provision, but it's not the money. It's everything else that God provides. So with that, let's get into this. All right, let's talk about how much do you say, would you say the average person today in America earns annually? 50000 Would you all agree probably 50000 is an average? Okay. So the common person earns $50,000 a year. And let's say that he gives his tithe. A tithe is a tenth portion. That's what a tithe means. So he's going to give $5,000 to the Lord, right? All right. Now, within the common people, you have 12 tribes. And when they give their tithes, where do they give it? To the Levite servants. Right, to the Levite servants. They, they give the tithes to the Lord. In the Old Testament, that's to the temple area. They bring it to the Levites. And what does the Lord do with their tithes? He gives it to the Levites. He said, I am your inheritance, so you keep all the tithes and the offerings that come through. Things that, you know, there's a set of rules, but specifically, they keep all the tithes. So there's one tribe of Levi and 12 tribes of common people. So that means that that I've got 12 people giving to one, 12 people, 12 common people giving to one Levite servant. Does that make sense? So I'm going to have 5,000 times 12, which works out to $60,000. Does that make sense? So now we see this by the Levite servants doing the ministry of the Lord, serving people, focused on serving the people that, that the Lord wants to minister to. The Lord provides for the Levite servants. And he provides for them at a level that's actually greater than the average person gets. And the average person is toiling all day long. If they're managing herds, they're toiling all day long and all night long. It's an 18 or 20 hour job, 24 hours a day. The Levite servants, they don't work as hard. When they work, they're working hard, but they can put up work. And they make more. But then the Levites are called to give. So this is the tithe over here that the common people give. The Levites are called to give what's called a, the tithe of the tithe. So they are giving 10% of their earnings. So that means they're giving $6,000. There's something else about this that's being given. The common people, when they bring their tithes, they're bringing the first and the best 10% of everything they have. 
So that means the best that they have are now going to the Levite servants. So this $60,000 is not only more, but it's the best of all of the common people. So it's even better than just 60000 Then the Levite servants take the best of all that they have, and they do a tithe of the tithe. So that's going to be 6000 But the question is, how many Levite servants are there for every one priest? If you go back and look at how this is done, you have the nation of Israel. Actually, you have the tribe of Levi, okay, that we're talking about right now. And so the tribe of Levi has all of these clans and all these family groups. And one of the family lineages is this lineage that has Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Okay, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, they're all brothers and sisters. The priests come only from Aaron's line and his direct descendants, okay? So we've got a lot of Levites for every one priest. Is this making sense? Let's assume for a moment that there is 200 Levite servants for every one priest, I don't know what the number is, but I would think that 200 would be a, at the most, it's on the low side. So now I've got Levite servants giving $6,000 each, and there's 200 of them. That means that the priests are receiving $1.2 million compared to the Levite servants of only 60,000. So let's put this in perspective. The common people who are focused on themselves, doing all their toiling, they receive $50,000 of provision in their life. The Levite servants, these are the people that are focused on others to serve the Lord by serving His people. They not only receive $60,000 of provision, so they receive more provision with less effort, but the provision they receive is a greater quality provision. But then those who are focused on the Lord and serving Him directly, the Lord's provision, in this case, is $1.2 million of total provision. In other words, if we just look at this kind of um, in concept-wise, what we see is that as we move into this greater maturity in Christ, the level of quality of life and the family benefit and the family life is so much huger than anything else. I remember talking to a friend. I met him in a hallway and he's a really great uh, Bible studier. He's a huge Levite servant, really serving others. Uh, has spent his entire life there. And uh, and I said, you know, uh, you know, how are, how are you? And he said, I am in God's hand. <laughs> he said, How are you? I said, I am blessed. Right. The difference, you could just hear this kind of this agony. I'm in God's hand. I am working hard and there's all kinds of issues in my life. And I'm making it through, but I know I'm in God's hand. For me, it's like it's sunshine. It's bright, beautiful blue sky days every day. I am blessed. And that's the difference between doing that. Is this making sense? Let me ask one last question, though. So now we have, with these people, we have the level of God's provision within their lives. Let's talk on one more thing. How much effort are they putting forth in their lives? So now, this last line, I want to do effort. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being greatest amount of effort and toil, Common people, how much effort and toil do you think they put forth in their lives? Maybe a nine. Maybe a nine, okay. Let's call it a nine. What about the Levite servants? How much effort do you think they're actually toiling? 
maybe a five. It's lot. It's a lot less. Maybe it's a you know maybe it's a five to six, but it's a lot less than common people. Keep in mind, toiling is not just hours worked. It's not just how hard you work, but it's all that mental anguish and concern and anxiety and frustration. It's like, it's just, it just showed me something real quick. He told me, this is the people that were hired early in the day. This is the one that was hired at the 11th hour. <laughs> and this is the other one. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, you kind of see it. You do. You know, this was, you know, they're all, and he's hired the 11th hour, so he's working less. Yeah. Yeah. But he showed me this, baby. This is something else I was studying. Okay, let me, before you go, let oh, me finish the, the yeah. line of thought, okay? So... If the common people, let's call common people 9 to 10 hours of effort, 9 to 10 units of effort, the Levite servants 5 to 6, how many do you think the priests are actually working and toiling? They're not sweating. (laughs) So maybe one, okay? To have the greater level of provision with the least amount of stress, effort, anxiety, and, and sweat and toil, that's huge. This is what we start to see. We can also look at it uh, in a comparison, not a true comparison, but a similar comparison. If I were to draw a pyramid right here, and you have the lower half of the pyramid, these are workers, then the part of the top half of the pyramid, these are managers. And at the very top, you have CEO. Okay? So I want to be sensitive. There's nothing condescending about being a common person or a Levite servant or a priest. Each one is important within God's economy. They play different roles. We can't all be priests because someone's got to get the work done. Right? If you look at a corporate structure, you may have a hundred employees, and out of those hundred employees, probably 95 of them, let's call it 90 to 95, are workers. They actually do all of the production of that company. Then you have probably somewhere between five to nine of them that are the managers, and they are caring for the workers, managing their production, guiding it, And then you have one CEO. In a normal corporation, who puts forth the most labor of work? The workers. Who puts forth the least labor? The CEO. The CEO. (laughs) Who gets paid the lowest hourly wages? The workers. Mm -hmm. Who gets paid the most? The CEO. It's the same concept. And it's not... The difference is in the world of Christendom is we all have the opportunity to pursue sonship. We all have the opportunity, and the Lord wants us to, turn from our flesh and be led by the Spirit. But it's a choice. It's a choice to obey God by denying yourself. It's a choice to pursue Him Not just study his word and memorize it, but to pursue intimacy with them and learn to hear his voice and learn to discern what do you want me to do and be willing to do it. Like we had a situation I mentioned earlier. We have a uh, test of faith that the Lord did with us with some new neighbors. And one time they uh, uh, texted us threatening to call the tow truck to pull some of our Bible study cars out from in front of their, their house, right? So what happens to me, I get riled up. I'll do this. And the Lord said, what do you think I want you to do? I know what you want me to do. Love them. Okay, right? You know, I have to give up my flesh and follow the Spirit. And the more we do that, we're all called to do that. But the thing I want to encourage us all on is as we do that, the benefits are huge. You work less, you receive more. It is the upside down kingdom. Yeah. You're moving into Eden's reality from the place of toil. When you look at the curse of Genesis 3, it's all about toil. 
So the more that you're walking by the Spirit, the more you're living in that Eden reality that is restful. And yeah. Efficient. So for those who can't hear on the audio, uh, Caroline was saying that as we move from the common people, which is toil, to the priesthood, we're moving into Eden. So if you think about the first Adam started in Eden, and all he had to do was tend. He did not toil. God produced all the abundance. God planted the garden for him. He just tended it. It produced all the abundance. When he fell, he was thrown out of the garden and into what we call the common people, where now it's all toil, all labor, sweat of his brow to earn a living, just to eke out a living. And then the second Adam comes in the role of a common person and creates the pathway that we can then become priests again back into Eden, back into our promised land. And this is where we're talking about an adoption to sonship. You can walk in sonship today by faith. We are sons of God by faith if you do it today. In Galatians 5, it was saying, for all who are led by the Spirit are no longer under law. All who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. But those who are not led by the Spirit, because they're following their flesh, they are under law. So they come back over lots of strife, lots of toil, low quality of life. You see this big picture throughout Scripture. Isn't it cool? What I was going to say is um, the other day, God woke me up and he said, I want you to look at two things, transfigured, transformed and transfigured. And it's basically what you're saying because he said in transformed is 53.99 and it's got a word with near. But the transfigured is the, another word. It's a 53.99 plus it's in the midst of. And he's actually saying, like, when you're transformed, that's the transforming by your mind. Mm -hmm. So you're in a process, but transfigured is a supernatural thing. That's why you're dressed different. You know, your bonnet's different, your headgear's different, and all that. That's what, that's being Christ likeness in his image. That is what he's saying. And, And in that, he was showing me that, that you got. Of the peace offering, the person that's transfigured, he gets a wave offering and a heave offering, and they're sacred, and they have to be eaten in the most holy place. You know, you can't save part of it or anything. You know, it has to be eaten totally in the holy place. And I'm thinking transformed, I mean transfigured, because I really thought transformed was the highest level. But when you search out the words, transfigured is, that's what Jesus was on the mountain. Yes. And his his clothes shone, and his face shone like the sun. And remember, his clothes were emanating the light. And that's what happened with Moses. That is really neat. When he saw him face to face. Mm -hmm. But that's where we're going. And we can go there. Transfiguration. Yes, and we can get there now by faith if we're willing to deny ourself, mm-hmm. deny the flesh, mm-hmm. and only obey the Spirit. Because we'll be in the midst of Him. That's right. what He said. He and us, us and Him, and He and us. That's what He's talking about when He said He'll be in the midst. We're in the midst of Him. He's in the midst of us. Let me wrap up real quick with four takeaways from all of this with the Do Not Sweat series. Okay, these are the four takeaways that I get out of it. Number one is, as we walk in sonship, we enter God's presence. The Levite servants and the common people do not enter God's presence. It's only the priesthood, only those walking in sonship. Number, they get nearer and nearer. They get nearer and nearer. Nearer and nearer. And everyone can do it. Right. Everyone can progress into sonship if they're willing to be deliberate about doing it. Number two is we have a responsibility for holiness. Responsibility for holiness. 
The Lord has called us to be holy. He has called us to honor Him in His holiness. That's why, and, I got, the, that's why I got the breast and the right shoulder. And He showed me that in just in a wave as you're doing this. Heaving as you're doing this. This is what Catholics do. Okay. When they do that, the up and down motion, yeah. right and left motion and up and down motion. That's what is represented by the wave offering and the heave offering. I did not know that. I didn't either. It just hit me when I started doing it that that's what they do. That's just a symbol of the cross. Yeah. Very, very fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. With the responsibility for holiness, it's also to teach others, mm-hmm. right? The third thing is we are to obey him. And the key with this is to do his work his way. If you don't do his work his way, you're not obeying him. That's why he had statutes and judgments. Mm -hmm. Um, To diligently obey the Lord is especially as it relates to doing his work, is what he's called us to do. Each son has a different role, right? We all have unique uh, good works that we've been created to walk in. And so every son is different. God gives each person specific instructions on how to do the work he's called them to do. Our job is to do that. And if we veer from doing his work, and veer off of doing it his way into our own effort, our thinking, our wisdom, our fleshly effort, it doesn't count. It doesn't please him, and it doesn't produce anything, because to do the Lord's work, it's all eternal impact, and flesh cannot produce eternal impact. So even if it looks like we're getting results, it really doesn't count for what he's called us to do. And this is where... Any work that we do through our own effort, through our own flesh, he counts as filthy rags. You remember the story I shared from Jessie Penn Lewis? She was a Welsh evangelist. And she had this vision of a hand holding up these filthy rags in an ugly light. And the Lord spoke to her and said, This is what all of your work for your entire life for me is counted as, filthy rags. But she said, But Lord, I've been consecrated. For you, I've been doing it this all for you. And she said, yes, but it's been consecrated flesh. She'd been doing the Lord's work her way. And so we need to be careful to do it his way. And then the number four is don't worry about your provision. When you are serving the Lord, there is no worry about your provision because he has promised to take care of it because he is our inheritance. And with this, you know, this has always been a struggle for me because I'm in business. I look at our profit and loss, which is our income statement coming through with the business. And sometimes I feel like I know the Lord's called me in ministry and the ministry is my business community initially. And so I need to grow my business so I can grow my ministry. Because as the business customers grow, my ministry grows. So I get this wrong thinking, and this is where the Lord's been correcting me. He said, no, you're not supposed to grow your business. You're my son. I'll tend to your business. You just tend to operations. You can't make a crop grow. Right, you can't, I can't make it grow. And everything I've tried to grow, this, is, this was really sobering. I had actually I've been in business for 26, 27 years now. I went back and listed out all of the big growth spurts where we just kind of lurched forward. And every single one of those, I had nothing to do with. I was working over here, working my tail off. It produced nothing, and just boom, over here. And that's when the Lord started getting a hold of me and saying, look, your work, your effort is worthless. It doesn't do anything. Your business grows when I declare it's going to grow. I want you to focus on my work and tend your business. And over the years, I've learned that that's the way I need to do it. You told me one time, I only received to myself what proceeds from myself. Yeah. I thought, oh, that's heavy. (laughs) So um, the key in all this is you walk in it through faith, and you walk in it through faith by denying yourself and saying, only you, Lord. 
Um, so that is the end of do not sweat. And if you walk in priesthood, in sonship, you don't have to sweat. God provides, and it's very scary. Yes, it's very scary because you never see it before he provides it. But he says, act as if you have it because I'll take care of you. Do you have a question? So that sounds wonderful. So why did the disciples have so much persecution and in their life in a pretty bad <laughs> Yeah, they worked big time. <laughs> yeah, so provision and persecution are different. Uh, persecution, they actually, they were actually thrilled when they were persecuted. So in early Acts, the disciples are called into the uh, council and the leaders are asking them, why did you disobey us? We said, don't go preach God's word anymore. You know, preach Jesus. And they said, well, for us to obey you or God, you be the judge. You know, we're going to obey God. And so they let them go, but they let them go with a flogging. And it said when they left, they rejoiced that they were found worthy to receive a flogging for his name. Because Jesus says, and then I'll let you just, Jesus says, um, when you are persecuted for the sake of my name, re- leap for joy and rejoice. And in the Greek, the word being used, you greatly rejoice. Uh, there are different words to determine kind of great, but this is the one that I'll call the most magnificent, the biggest, the power, most powerful, great. Leap for joy, for great is your reward. What he is saying is, be thrilled when you're persecuted because that means your reward in heaven is even more. But here's something interesting. If you look at who gets persecuted, the common people focus on themselves, the Levite servants focus on others, or the priests focus on the Lord. Which one do you get perse- think get persecuted the most? Levite. Yeah, no, the, the priests. Oh. Yeah, the ones who are, the more you're focused on serving the Lord, the more you're going to be that's persecuted. What I, that's what Paul used. The afflictions he had been through mm-hmm. was the proof of his ministry. That's right. That's right. He proved he was a real apostle. And the reason we're persecuted is because we're rejecting the flesh and only following the Spirit. So there's a difference between provision of quality of life and persecution. They, it's, it's like two different realms, but they intersect. You know, you can be in persecution, but love, you know, the Lord's abundant provision. Well, our rewards are... In heaven, yeah. <laughs> so, so and, I, and I do want to be sensitive. I'm not saying that as you move into sonship, you're going to be rich. That's not it at all. The disciples were poor most of the time, but they never lacked. Jesus never had much money, but he never lacked. Everything that happened in his life was directed by the Lord, and that's the safest place to be. And that's what I'm talking about in the priesthood, in the sonship. Everything that happens in your life more and more becomes entirely directed by the Lord, so it's all good.